Mr. Uh, great to see you. Thanks for taking out uh, some time for this episode of Vartalap. How are you doing? I am doing good, uh, uh, Anand. Thanks for inviting me for this uh, session. I uh, hope you are doing well too. Yes, sir. So for my listeners, uh, sir has more than 40 years of work experience. He worked uh, uh, close to 10 years at uh, Computer Sciences Corporation, uh, was a business unit head of uh, the uh, Hewitt uh, project that I was part of. He's an IIT Madras alumnus, um, currently associated with PALS, a voluntary group of pan IIT alumni with the objective to improve quality of engineering education. Sir, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you had done your civil engineering from IIT Madras. So it's been... Uh, that's that's yeah. correct, Kaman. I did civil engineering in 1977. I graduated from IIT Madras. Okay. Sir, what... So it's been a very long time. How do you see that engineering, evolu uh, engineering education has evolved in, the, in India for last 30-40 uh, years? And what, what are the things which ail engineering education in India? So, uh, you know, in 40 years, uh, there have been a lot of changes. Uh, firstly, uh, from a five-year program, mm -hmm. it has been curtailed to a four-year program. You know? right. uh, that's one major change. And uh, uh, in those days, we used to have a lot of uh, practical experience, uh, mm -hmm. so much so that uh, in IIT Madras, in the first year, every alternate week, we'll have a workshop. Okay. So, so that we appreciate the dignity of labor. And, uh, you know, in the shop floor, we can roll up our sleeves and show it to workers that uh, things can be done. So we used to have every alternate week uh, workshop. We have uh, gone through uh, shops such as uh, carpentry, uh, you know, machine shop, uh, fitting, uh, welding, electricity, uh, you know, furnace, uh, smithy, um, welding and so on. You know, lots of uh, different types of uh, workshops we have gone through. So we used to have a lot of practical uh, exposure to uh, the engineering aspect of uh, learning. I'm not sure whether there's so much uh, workshop, uh, hands-on uh, training that is there uh, in the engineering curriculum today. Okay. That is one thing. And uh, our uh, window of learning and uh, the opportunity for learning was uh, primarily through uh, lectures from our professors and reading books in the library. Okay. Uh, and also in the class, we used to pay a lot of attention to the uh, lectures that we were, you know, attending. And mm -hmm. so much so that we'll take notes and uh, where uh, the notes are not clear, we'll go to the library, refer mm -hmm. books. And uh, that's the way, you know, we had the rigors of learning. Uh, in our times, uh, the listening window uh, is uh, normally around uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, today, I believe uh, through research, it has been found out that the listening window is about seven minutes. So okay. the pedagogy has also undergone major change in mm -hmm. terms of uh, more than teaching is learning. So okay. how best uh, learning is uh, accomplished by students attending classes, mm -hmm. there are a lot of different methods of learning and uh, those things are also uh, uh, you know, uh, contributing to a lot of changes in today's uh, engineering education system. Uh, uh, don't you think that there is more clamor for innovation these days? So, uh, most of the students who come out of India from Indian engineering colleges are not directly employable. But one of the things which the government and people at the top are trying to do is to bring innovation into education so that people are, the students are more hands-on. Where do you think this will take India or the education in, in engineering in India in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, definitely uh, there's a major shift in the mindset of uh, individuals and the youth of today to do something on their own, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they're directly uh, coming in, uh, coming in contact with the society, its problems, challenges, and a uh, lot of uh, the proportion of students who want to do something on their own uh, with the, their own innovative thoughts and mind uh, is more uh, compared to our times, you know. So uh, and also you mentioned uh, PALS, you know. Uh, yeah. PALS is one of the focuses to. Uh, develop engineers uh, who can solve problems, be creative uh, in produce, in providing solutions to society, and uh, people you know can uh, uh, embark on design thinking and so on. Yes, definitely, there's a lot of innovative bent of mind among students today, and uh, PALS has got programs uh, which is called Innova, which is a kind of a nine month long uh, program where we give a problem uh, of the society, current so society problem, and we ask the students to come up with an innovative solution 
and uh, typically they submit a concept and design document about an innovative solution and the uh, concept and design document is uh, evaluated by a panel of experts and they have to show a prototype or a working model with minimum usable features typically you know they uh, exhibit their products in iit madras research park um, so to put a number uh, in the pals ecosystem we have got about uh, 30 plus engineering colleges who who okay. signed up with pals for okay. uh, getting the advantage of the pals uh, goals mm -hmm. of uh, you know improving the quality of engineering education uh, we have uh, every year for the innova competition uh, we have about 165 entries uh, about five uh, teams from each college can submit their innovation entry out of that we shortlist uh, one entry per each college so 35 teams 35 to 40 teams exhibit okay. their products that's the kind of number uh, just to extend this uh, innova competition last year engineering a healthy world for the team mm -hmm. around this team uh, t, t, you know, students from multiple engineering disciplines can come together and okay. uh, they can come up with uh, the innovative ideas and the working model or prototype. You know? uh, so out of that, uh, we selected about uh, five or uh, six top people and we awarded cash prizes and so on. So any success so stories, any, any big su success stories which have come out of this program as yet? Many of them. See, the success is... Uh, Born by the fact that a uh, lot of corporate houses, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Muruga Pachetia Group and mm -hmm. Power Power Gear and all, mm -hmm. they have shown interest in uh, taking some of the products and uh, incubating, funding those uh, you know prototypes and models uh, uh, to a commercial scale. So okay. they give a three-year uh, window for mm -hmm. the students to partner with them, use their research lab, use their material, use their facilities to okay. scale up the a prototype uh, what uh, what was presented in in our competition right. and take it to the next level okay so moving to the experience part of it uh, which you have gained for over 40 years so you led the information technology uh, unit in, in in computer sciences corporation and you have had a long checkered career in in the software and it industry what right. is it that you have seen in the past 40 years in terms of transformation we live in a VUCA world currently where there is more cloud for things around cloud, big data, artificial intelligence. How do you see that evolution in the last 40 years of your career? Yeah, over the 40 years, actually, the numbers have, you know, definitely quantum leaped. Uh, to put uh, perspective, you know, in 1980, I attended, I attended a, a major, major conference in India, industry conference, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, the about 300 people from government, industry, university, and various uh, organizations had attended. At that time, the trans uh, export, software exports value was about uh, 100 million dollars from India. Okay, and uh, company, uh, countries like China, Brazil, and all had actually uh, gone up to several billion. So one of the questions asked was, uh, Will India ever reach 1 billion dollars? That was in 1980. Today, we are talking about close to $140 billion of export. So in 40 years, from uh, from uh, under $1 billion, we have come 150 times more to $150 billion. Okay. Just to trace the history of uh, Indian software industry, uh, see, uh, set the clock back to about 1968. Uh, let me take a few minutes to walk you through the journey sure. of Indian industry going global. So 1968, uh, time as TCS uh, were the primary uh, software exporters, they used to send uh, highly educated, highly skilled people on site on B visa for 11 months. Typically, they will uh, join the client team to do uh, project work in uh, mainly healthcare, banking, insurance, manufacturing, and so on. And uh, they would, after the 11 month period, they will bring a portion of the work to do in India. Right. And they will again take back to America to implement and then train the users and so on. From 1968, which came up that, that and uh, the American companies and most of the other global companies realized that uh, these people are highly skilled. They don't need supervision. They can do a lot of work in India. They can set up uh, facilities in India. They slowly moved to uh, you know shifting computers from the U.S. Uh, uh, putting it in uh, India. So mm -hmm. those days, uh, you know, there's heavy licensing regulations uh, mm -hmm. and approvals required. And right. uh, computerization was seen to be, you know, creating unemployment in the country. So the mm -hmm. government and the political arms were not in favor of uh, computerization in a major way. 
Yeah. But some of the leading uh, industrialists like Tata's and others, they had a firm belief that uh, computers and uh, software services is going to uh, rule the world and they wanted to have a big pie. So they right. gradually, you know, built the capability of India. So in the 1980 to 1990, I would say it was purely license Raj where uh, some of the uh, young educated uh, uh, rich people used to set up uh, startup companies, importing mm -hmm. computers like Burroughs, you know, DEC, uh, PDP-11, Data General, Wang, and so on. They used to start data centers, computer centers for uh, oh. giving bureau services and developed software. Oh. 1991, uh, Narasimha Rao government brought about a major uh, uh, change in the Indian government that, is, uh, that you know, the opened the economy, uh, Indian economy, and allow a lot of people to come in. And 1990 to 2000, there was a year, Y2K, you know, the millennium change issue was there. And Indian companies got a major, major opportunity to do a remediation of the software, uh, which was, uh, which were expected to break, uh, you know, when the new uh, millennia opens. And uh, that actually um, showcased the Indian skill on a large, large scale. And uh, many companies, want, uh, they you know, set up a lot of centers. And uh, in 2000 to 2010, in the 10 year period, Indian companies really went through, you know, uh, to a high scale. And uh, they built a huge facility with, uh, you know, several hundred thousand people. For example, TCS got uh, close to 4 lakh, uh, 400,000 employees. Infosys got close to 300,000 employees. So they employed in large number and they perfected uh, global delivery model for follow the sun's kind of support where you know uh, from japan to you know east uh, west coast of america the yeah. companies uh, used to get support uh, through one team right. and uh, they perfect a global delivery model and they also uh, uh, showcased that uh, indian engineers can learn any new technology okay so going back to my point in 1980 to 1990 any technology that was released in the U.S., it would take at least three or four years to reach India. Whereas today, you know, whatever releases happen, they happen globally. And if it is released in the U.S., same day it gets released in India as well. So we don't lag behind any versions, you know, right. in, terms of, in terms of the hardware model, operating system or software product. So we have come a long way in the, you know, software arena. And uh, we are actually among uh, the leaders in the uh, software field whether it's product innovation or any new solution. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, a lot of exports that happen from India, especially from software and uh, IT industry are still service based. Though there is a growth in terms of products and platforms with people solving new challenges these days, how do you forecast the product and platform evolution in the country in the next 10 to 15 years? Do you see more product, digital products coming out uh, by young companies and by entrepreneurs? Yeah, young companies, you know, yes, startups are producing uh, niche products in healthcare, artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, IIT Research Park has incubated a lot of new companies uh, who are from young uh, IIT graduates who don't want to go on employment. They've set up a lot of uh, factories. They're in different uh, business domain. There are a lot of uh, products are being developed and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, multinationals are funding those uh, projects and uh, uh, you know, they're kind of uh, uh, taking it to a commercial scale. Yeah, there are a lot of things going on. So but do you think that, primarily, just sorry. wanted to interrupt you. So do you think something like uh, a Facebook or a Twitter or a Google or an Alphabet, the parent company, can come out of India in the next 10 to 15 years? Yes, see, if you see, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, Zoom actually was a conferencing tool and uh, the few Indian companies have come up with a similar tool. Right. And uh, Zoho, which is actually a, a cloud-based software, yeah. they already had a, a video conferencing and event management tool, you know? Right. So, yeah. uh, so only in India, the marketing is not so, you know, I would say powerful to take it to a global market. But uh, there are products and there are uh, people with such capability who can build the product. Okay. They're just watching, watching the need and they've carefully making sure that there's a proper return on investment payback. So, so you know, they're very cautious in, in this particular uh, uh, aspect.
So one thing which has also moved in last 30, 40 years is how how do company, especially bigger companies, conglomerates, appraise their employees. So there was a good old uh, bell curve which used to drive appraisals for close to 30 years. These days we have moved to something called as objective and key results where there is goal setting being done. It started by, it was started by Intel, Google picked it up and a lot of corporations are doing. So how do you see uh, this appraisal culture or how, how do you reward uh, your employees going forward? How would, how would this change out? How will this pan out if the bell curve is out? Yeah, I think a uh, lot of people are, you know, kind of reviewing their performance appraisal mechanism. A uh, lot of uh, new ideas are emerging. Uh, so with the kind of uh, churn that is happening, uh, uh, you know, people are wondering what would be an appropriate uh, mechanism. Definitely an objective uh, mechanism to recognize uh, meritorious employees. Uh, you know, different companies have different ways of uh, replacing the bell curve based appraisal system, but still bell curve used is where there's a large number of employees that's still used uh, because many companies have evolved their own ways of uh, interpreting the bulk of, you know. Uh, so where there is uh, uh, people who are uh, on their own uh, in startups and all, uh, this bulk of is not so much uh, adopted. Right. Where there's a large employee uh, population, mm -hmm. this bulk of is still used. And uh, as I said, uh, companies have their own uh, way of uh, interpreting the results. Okay, so one last question would be uh, a lot of youngsters are entering entering the workforce every year. What will be your message to people who are joining the workforce today? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, in my experience uh, uh, spanning 40 years, I've seen uh, you know, all kinds of things uh, are required in a workplace. Um, all kinds of things are required in a business or economy. So whatever comes your way, Without saying no, uh, just uh, do whatever is you know coming your way, whatever is the need of the hour. And secondly, um, don't have the fear of failure. No. Uh, unless you do something, unless you fail in something, unless you make mistakes, you don't learn. Right. You you know take the uh, you know the situation where uh, mistakes are committed and uh, there are failures as a kind of experience, and uh, build on that experience and compile lessons uh, from that experience and improve upon your next uh, attempt, you know, next uh, whatever you do, next endeavor. Okay. So, and also, uh, you know, develop creative skills and uh, read a lot of books. Uh, you know, if you have to take a topic like uh, I used today, you know, in physics, uh, when I learned, I used to open at least three textbooks and refer to three books and see what the authors used to say and, uh, you know, internalize the theory. I think that works and goes a long way compared to reading just books from a digital media. Right. Okay, sir. It's been a, a great conversation. Uh, and getting your insights and I believe it will help a lot of youngsters and people who are in the workforce currently. I'm sure our listeners would be indebted to you for taking time today. Uh, in future, I'll be happy to have you on a panel discussion too. Thanks for your time today, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you um, uh, for organizing this short uh, interview. Uh, it's been a pleasure interacting with you, talking about the needs of the current uh, you know, student community. Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend. Have a nice weekend. You too. Nice.